This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. The Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research on Aging is committed to advancing lifelong health and well-being through research, professional training, patient care, and community service. As a nonprofit organization at the University of California San Diego School of Medicine, our research and educational outreach activities are made possible by the generosity of private donors. It is our vision that successful aging will be an achievable goal for everyone. To learn more, please visit our website at aging.ucsd.edu. I'm thrilled to see all of you here tonight. We're here to listen to a lecture by Dr. Lisa Eiler called, What Can We Learn About Cognitive and Emotional Aging from a Blood Sample? Dr. Eiler is an associate professor here at UC San Diego in the Department of Psychiatry. She's also the associate director of the Neuroimaging Unit of the San Diego VA Mental Illness Research and Education and Clinical Center. Her research focuses on the biological basis of neurocognitive and emotional functioning in aging, development, and mental illness. As a faculty member in the Stein Institute for Research on Aging, she leads projects examining brain response correlates of successful cognitive and emotional aging. She currently leads an NIMH-funded study of brain aging among people with bipolar disorder. Dr. Eiler is also co-investigator on a study of aging in twins. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Eiler. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. So as you heard, I'm going to be talking tonight about what can we learn about cognitive and emotional aging from a blood sample. And I hope the answer is going to be a great deal. But I also will say that we have more to learn as well. And I'm going to be talking about that uh, towards the end of the lecture. So I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about the idea of the average older adult. A lot of research on the biology of aging has relied on the technique of comparing a group of younger individuals with a group of older individuals, and to some extent ignoring differences among people who are aging. And so I want to try and point out the importance of looking at these differences. And then I'm going to talk about three different types of blood-based markers of aging or uh, blood-based characteristics that are associated with both cognitive and emotional aging, genotype, telomeres, and inflammatory markers. I'm going to then move on to talking about what we still don't know and things that we would like to know, remaining questions and issues uh, regarding blood-based biomarkers of aging, and then at the end, hopefully raise some provocative questions about what the school what the implications are for enhancing quality of life in old age. So some of you may be familiar with this radio program, News from Lake Wobegon, where they say all the women are strong, all the men are good looking, and all the children are above average. <laughs> so as you know, it's not possible for everyone to be above average. There is a bell-shaped curve of most traits in humans such that the majority of people fall at the mean or the average, and then fewer and fewer people as you get out to the ends of this distribution. But what I'd like to emphasize is that although not everyone can be above average, it's also the case that not everybody can be average. So when we talk about the average older adult, we're sort of ignoring the people on either end. And for things in aging, there's actually quite a distribution. So I've just shown some pictures here about physical aging, although I'm not going to talk about physical aging tonight. But there are 90-year-olds who run marathons. There are the more typical folks who have some problems with mobility. And then there are folks who are bedridden. 
So there's clearly a big range of how people physically age. What about cognitive aging? There's also a big range in how people perform cognitively uh, at all ages, but also particularly in old age. So this graph, I'd like to orient you to this. On the y-axis over here is reaction time or slowness. So higher numbers mean slower reaction time. On the x-axis is age, and it ranges from 20 to 80 in this case. And each dot here represents the performance of one individual on a test of speed, how quickly, say, they can press a button after they see a signal to press. And so there's a couple of things that I want to point out here. One thing is that, on average, you can see that the group as a whole gets slower as they get older. And this is usually the main takeaway message from a graph like this. That's why they put this line here. They're saying, on average, everybody's getting slower as they get older. But I want to point out two other features of this graph. First of all, I'd like to point out that there are some people here in their 70s and 80s who are performing at the same speed as these people here in their 20s and 30s. Okay? It's not the case that all the older adults are up here in the slow zone and all the younger adults are speedy. Okay? There are some people, uh, regardless of age, that are at this same speed. Another thing I want to point out is the shape here which is that there's actually a bigger range of reaction times in the older adults than there are in the younger adults. So they're clustered a bit more together, whereas in the older adults it spreads out. And this, in general, is what we see in aging. There's generally more differences among people as you get older, which if you think about it is a little interesting because people often talk about the problem of um, the fact that a lot of people are dying and what the, who's left in your samples to come in and press the button are the hearty and healthy people, right? But the, the, case, the fact of the matter is, if that was the case, you would actually expect that the range might constrict because only the quickest folks that haven't died off yet would be coming to your studies. But in fact, we're still seeing a large range here. What about brain size? Is there variability among older adults in the size of the brain? This is just one example about the volume of the hippocampus, which is a part of the subcortical part of the brain that's important for learning and memory. This graph, again, is showing on the y-axis, it's the size of the hippocampus relative to uh, some average here. And then on the x-axis is age from 20 to 100. And again, each dot is one person's hippocampal volume. And again, what you can see is, on average, there's a decline. And in fact, it's not a linear decline. It starts off sort of slow and then speeds up as you get past about the age of 60. But again, I want to point out that there are some people in their 80s and 90s who have the same size hippocampus as people in their 20s and 30s. So again, it's not the case that all of the older adults have small hippocampi. So I think that's important to note about brain aging as well. There's a lot of variability. Now, so far I've showed you two pictures from what we call cross-sectional studies. These are studies where we bring people in at lots of different ages and measure them one time. But maybe what's more important to each individual, as you're thinking to yourself, what's going to happen to me? Am I going to decline as I get older? Is the result of a longitudinal study where we bring people in multiple times over the course of their life and find out what happens in the trajectory of each individual. So here's an example about variability in the trajectory of, brain, of cognitive change. So this graph is a little bit different. Instead of having dots, it has lines. And each line represents an individual who was tested on two different occasions, sometimes as much as about five years apart. And the lines start at the age in which they first came into the study. Okay? So some people came into the study when they were around 65. Other people came in when they were 90. But they were followed and tested on multiple occasions across those years. And then this line represents the trajectory of their cognitive change. So again, I'd like to point out that although there is sort of a slight decline here overall, that is, the trajectories get a little steeper as you get um, older, Really, the most important thing to note is a lot of variability. 
Look at this 90-year-old here, came into the study for the first time at age 90 and was performing very well on this test of working memory, which is um, being able to hold information in, in mind and manipulate that and be able to, to bring it back out later on. That kind of working memory um, was very stable in this individual. And then here we have sort of a 77-year-old or so that came in and had a very precipitous drop in their working memory abilities over the course of the study. So again, even when we're talking about change within an individual, there's a lot of variability. So, so far I've been showing you all things that generally go down with aging. So I don't want to depress everyone um, because although there are a lot of things that go down and unfortunately all that sort of the societal message that everything gets worse as we get older, uh, the Stein Institute for Research on Aging and myself are very interested in things that don't change or maybe even get better with age. And we uh, have conducted a study called the Successful Aging Evaluation Survey or the SAGE survey where we we have surveyed a community members in San Diego County by, by mail with a large questionnaire including many different types of traits, including ones that we expected may not change with age. And this is just an example of one of those. So this is, again, the same kind of plot. Um, we actually start surveyed, started surveying people as young as 25 years old actually as young as 20 years old, and we have people from 20 to 100 now. And again, each of these green circles is a single individual's response, and this score here is a score on what's called the Santa Clara Brief Compassion Scale. This is a five-item scale that asks people to say, how likely are you to help a stranger in need? So it's asking questions about how compassionate you are towards others, and particularly strangers, it asks about. And what you can see that here is that on average there is absolutely no difference in the mean score of the 20-year-olds compared to the 100-year-olds. Okay, so there is no decline in compassion with age. There's also no increase in compassion with age, but there's no decline in, in compassion with age. Moreover, again, I'd like to point out the, the huge variability that there is at all ages, including in our older sample here. So we can see that there are some people who are reporting to be very, very compassionate, and there are also plenty of people that are saying, not so much, I'm not as interested in helping strangers in need. We are very interested in this variability, and I'm going to come back to that later on when we talk about some of the markers. Um, but I just wanted to point out that it's not, not everything's going downhill, but the variability is a constant. That is, in all cases, almost everything that we look at, uh, people spread out quite a lot on the range. And so I think the, the take home message from that is that people age differently. Okay, and that the idea of the average older adult is probably a myth and probably something that's not going to help us to understand how people age and why they age. The goal of some of the work that we're doing at the Stein Institute as well as other researchers and that I want to share with you tonight is to really understand better this variability. And one way of doing that is to look at the biology. It's not the only way. Obviously, there's all kinds of factors in terms of society, environment, uh, social support, et cetera. But one way of looking at this variability and helping to understand it is, is to look more at the biology. And one way to look at that biology is through looking at a blood sample. So I'd like to now talk about three ways that a blood sample can be helpful in understanding differences between people as they age. Genotypes, telomere length, and inflammatory cytokine levels. Now these are by no means the only things that you can get out of a blood sample. I'm sure lots of you go to the doctor all the time. They ask to draw your blood. They measure a lot of different things besides these, uh, these things. And most of them have to do with seeing whether you're ill or well and how you're progressing in terms of your cholesterol level, et cetera. The, these are just three that I think have the most evidence right now for relationships to cognitive and emotional aging. And so I wanted to share them with you today. Okay, so genotype is the first one, and everybody probably recognizes this as the DNA double helix. So the DNA, as you know, is our genetic code. It what helps our, it's the blueprint that we have in every cell of our body that helps determine how our, how our body functions. And it does that by having a code that tr then gets turned into um, an RNA message, which then helps to create proteins. 
And so the pattern is to go from the code to the RNA to the proteins. Now, uh, our DNA, um, uh, each of our DNA genotype is actually very similar to one another, and that's what makes us all human. And actually, we're very similar to other non-human <laughs> uh, animals as well. But the, the great deal of similarity between our DNA, but there are places in which we differ from individual to individual. And so the genotype shows us the places where we may differ from person to person. And sometimes these differences in these uh, sort of coding areas here um, of genes make a difference to how the protein is created. Sometimes they make no difference whatsoever, but sometimes they do make a difference. They may make a difference in terms of how much of the protein is made. They may make a difference in terms of the shape that the protein comes out so that it doesn't function exactly the way it's supposed to. And so there are variations between us, and these types of variations may be related to variations in our cognitive function and our emotional function. So I'm going to talk about some of the research that has suggested that this may be the case. So here are some of the genes that have been most strongly related to cognitive function. Um, and when I say related to cognitive aging, most of the studies have actually not looked at uh, longitudinal or declines. Some of them have for APOE that is the case. Some of these others may be the case that these are related to cognition at all times of life. But let's start with um, apolipoprotein E. This is probably the one that you, most of you have heard about because it's a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And if you have one or more copies of this APOE4 version of this genotype, then you're at higher risk for getting Alzheimer's disease. And most studies of older adults also show that people who have one or more copies of the E4 also have poor cognitive performance. The jury is still kind of out on whether at a younger age having an APOE4 also means you perform more poorly cognitively. But one of the things that may therefore account for some of the variability between older adults and their cognitive performance may be whether or not they have an APOE4 allele. Another gene that people have looked at is the serotonin transporter gene. So this is a gene that codes for a transporter protein that helps to move serotonin out of the synaptic cleft and back to the presynaptic area. And so if you have a difference in this uh, region here, some people have a long region here and some people have a short one. And when you have a short one, it, uh, it, it sort of confers some risk because your serotonin transporter is not working as well. So this is a functional gene. It does actually affect the function of the protein. And people have suggested, the research has suggested that older adults that have this long allele do better cognitively. Another, um, and it's sort of not surprising that, now so apolipoprotein is interesting because it's the strongest relationship, but it really doesn't have anything directly to do with brain, neurotransmission, whatever, it has to do with movement of cholesterol. So there's indirect pathways, surely, but, uh, but it's an interesting one that that was the one that was so quickly found and has proved to be so related and doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the brain. Serotonin transporter gene, it makes more sense. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter, and so it makes sense that if you disrupt the function of that, it's going to make it harder for neurons to communicate with each other. Similarly, COMT, which stands for catechol o methyltransferase is another uh, gene and substance that has to do with neurotransmitters in the brain, in this case, dopamine. So there's two different versions of the COMT gene, and if you have the one that uh, gets you a MET amino, amino acid instead of VAL, then you actually have more dopamine available and your cognition tends to be better. Okay, so this is another one that's been related to cognitive performance. And then finally, there's a gene that codes for brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and this is important in uh, creating uh, new synapses and engaging in neuron growth. And this, uh, again, the more of this, the better for cognition. So if you have a version of BDNF gene that, that allows for there to be more of this protein available, then you're going to have better cognitive performance. 
Okay, what about emotional aging? First of all, let me just say, what do I mean by emotional aging? I'm using that as kind of a catchphrase, but again, I'm focusing on some of these positive psychological traits that often do not decline with age and may be protective against the effects of stress or loss or social support, that loss of social support that happens as you get older. And so we're very interested in these, these in factors that are related to these positive psychological traits which may be related to better quality of life. Um, one of the questions that we ask on the successful aging evaluation survey, the SAGE survey that I told you about, is um, how successful do you think you are aging? Very straightforward question. You rate yourself from one to seven. And what we found is that older adults rate themselves as more successful, actually, than younger adults do. There's kind of a U-shaped curve, but older adults tend to rate themselves as more successful. And, um, and of course, there's also variability within older adults in how successful they feel that they're being with their aging. And so a study by one of our collaborators, Ruth O'Hara up at Stanford, found that people who answered that they had high self rated successful aging, they felt that they were aging very successfully, were more likely to have this long allele version of the serotonin transporter gene. And other work, not done by us, um, has looked at this gene, which is uh, abbreviated CACNO1C. It's a calcium channel uh, voltage dependent 1C subunit type. It has to do with getting calcium in and out of the neuron when you are, uh, when it's getting depolarized. So it has to do with transfer of the electrical signal down the neuron. And this seems to be disrupted in disorders like bipolar disorder, for example. So um, having different versions of the CACNA1C genotype can confer risk for bipolar disorder. But the opposite allele, the non-risk allele, is seen in people who have greater optimism and greater resilience. So optimism being answering questions like, I think that good things are going to happen in the future and resilience having to do with your response to stressful life events, bouncing back quickly when bad things happen. So I don't want you all to just go rush out and ask your doctor, can you please genotype me for APOE, <laughs> CACNA1C, uh, et cetera, um, because there are some caveats to these associations. First of all, there are associations that are, they increase your relative risk for these things, or they're relatively associated with this, but not absolutely. Okay, so a lot of people have these polymorphisms. They're common polymorphisms. That's a, they're common variations in the genotype. Um, and so, if a lot of people have them, then they would all have worse cognitive aging, et cetera. And that's not the case. Okay, and probably the reason why any one of these by itself is not very predictive of how you're going to do cognitively or emotionally is because environmental factors obviously also play a role. So a lot of these traits. Uh, are, do have a big genetic component, but environmental factors are very important. Also, it's important to note that any one of these is not going to be the whole story in isolation. There are many ways in which genes interact and their protein products interact. And so um, it, it's possible that if you've got that whole panel of genes, that maybe you would have a better idea of how you're going to do, but nobody's really looked at how they interact and whether if you're high on one and low on the other, that's better than if you're high on both. So, the, those types of work or studies are still under, being undergone right now. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, the genes are just the blueprint, but things can happen between the blueprint and the protein. So uh, the degree to which these genes are expressed, meaning the degree to which they actually get made into proteins, is regulated by other types of factors that determine how much protein is, is expressed. So you could have the blueprint for the healthy version, but if you have some other factors coming in, things like methylation, you may have heard that term, et cetera, you may get different levels of expression of the gene. And that can happen differently at different times of your life, and it also can be expressed differently in the brain versus in the periphery. So we're just measuring things in the blood. It doesn't really tell us how much of that gene is actually getting expressed in your prefrontal cortex, for example, or in your hippocampus, where it might be helping your cognition. So it's important to remember those caveats, but I think we're starting to make some strides towards understanding how genes may play a role in these variability between people in cognitive and emotional factors. Okay, so let's turn now to telomere length. Telomeres, in case you haven't heard of them, 
are the protective coating on the ends of these chromatid here, which are the little ends of these X's that are your chromosomes. And that's where the DNA is all wound up in there. And um, what happens is that every time your, a cell divides, then these little ends get worn off a little bit more because the replication process can't go all the way to the tip. So we've, we've built in this little buffer zone here, but each time that it replicates, the DNA replicates, it doesn't quite make it to the end. And so you lose a little bit each time. Okay, and so eventually you might get to where it can't do the replication and cell division will stop at that point. And people have been interested in this because it seems to be that the older you are, the smaller, the shorter your, your telomeres. And so people have thought that this is a measure of a biological marker of aging. The question is, is it related to cognitive aging or to emotional aging, which is what we're talking about now. It's sort of a sign of cellular aging, but how is it related to these phenotypes that we're interested in? So uh, the largest study to date looking at this was done by Yaffe et al. She brought older adults into the lab and then followed them across time, across as many as seven years, and measured their cognitive performance across those follow-up periods. And um, she also measured at baseline, when they first came in, how long their telomeres were. And they classified them into three groups, short, medium, or long. So remember that short would mean that is kind of the, the worst case scenario, because that means you've lost a lot of your buffer zone there. And long would mean that you haven't lost so much of your buffer zone. So in this graph, we're looking at the scores on their cognitive, their cognitive performance scores on the y-axis and the years of follow-up on the x-axis. And there's three different lines. The solid line here is for the short telomeres. Long dashes are the medium, and the little dashes are the long. And what you can see here is the finding was that those people who at baseline, when they first came into the study, had long telomere length, had less decline in their cognition over the seven years. So there does seem to be a relationship between this marker of sort of cellular aging and a more global index of cognitive function. Telomeres have also been implicated in some factors having to do with emotional aging, specifically the response to stress. So it turns out that the more you've been exposed to stress, so for example, people who are doing a lot of high-level caregiving for a spouse or a loved one, um, or people who are exposed to other types of chronic stress, or even children who are exposed to uh, stress in their, um, from their parents, for example, have shorter telomeres. And if, however, you report that you are more resilient to stress and you have healthy responses to stress and you're able to see things as not being your fault necessarily, and so some of these psychological responses to stress that are healthy and more resilient, those folks that tend to have those also have longer telomeres. So there's an interesting relationship here between stress and resilience and telomeres, and so it's important for emotional aging, but then again, it may also be that you have to think about the interaction between emotional and cognitive aging, right? So that if you're resilient to stressors, you may also have less cognitive um, decline. Did I see a question? Interesting. Um, so uh, just to repeat the question for the TV, um, the, the um, mem audience member pointed out that there are different types of stress. Some may be positive, like a wedding. Some may be more negative and um, chronic and, and have a more negative impact. And are there differences in terms of tel effects on telomeres of those different types of stress? And I want to emphasize that this actually is not my work. This is the work of Alyssa Appel and her colleagues. Um, however, I believe that what she would say is that it's not so much the type of stress, but how you react to that stress. So if it is the case that you feel that the stressor is positive and so you can see it as a good a challenge, you know, a good thing, a challenge, and you're not afraid of it, um, then you're, you're, you will not have the telomere uh, shortening effect of that. However, if the stress, even if the stress was objectively positive, but you saw it as overwhelming and fearful. So, you know, some people might react to a wedding with just kind of giving up, you know, oh, this is just so much, I can't take it. That they may still get the telomere shortening, even sort of objectively the stressor should be a good one. 
okay. But of course, there's some caveats to this telomere work as well that I want to sh share with you. Um, it, this is not really a caveat, but I mentioned this before, that short telomeres may be something that actually starts really uh, early in life. So you can get telomere shortening from childhood adversity. And so if, it, whether this is really uh, as relevant to a talk about aging as it is a talk about development, I think we need to be looking at both of those things. Um, and also, um, you know, again, you might be thinking, okay, so is there anything I can do to lengthen my telomeres <laughs> at this point? Um, and there are, there are animal studies that have been done to try to activate some of the enzymes that are usually used in, in repair of the telomeres and um, to use strategies to try and lengthen them. It's not clear yet whether those will work in humans, but it certainly is an active area of study. However, even if we could lengthen the telomeres, it's again not clear if that's going to improve your cognitive function or your emotional function. Okay, so even though we see the correlation that people with worse cognitive function have shorter telomeres and worse emotional function have shorter telomeres, it's not really clear that if you lengthen them, that would reverse the functional changes. Okay, and then the last um, category that I'd like to talk about are inflammatory cytokines. So inflammation is your body's natural reaction to an acute insult. So if you burn your arm on the stove, it turns red and it swells up. And that is part of that acute reaction to that injury is the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines that are helping to mobilize your body's uh, immune response to try and deal with that insult and repair the tissue. So that's a normal process. There are also anti-inflammatory agents, which are uh, endogenous, which will help to balance that out. So you don't want to have too much inflammation, so you have anti-inflammatory things that come along to try and dampen that, and then everything goes back to its nice homeostatic state after you've healed whatever area has been insulted. In aging, there is evidence that we, you end up in a chronic pro-inflammatory state, okay? So not going around like with swelling and redness and that sort of thing. It's subclinical, very low levels, but it seems that the ratio is being weighted a bit more towards these pro-inflammatory compounds and against the anti-inflammatory compounds. So older adults have higher levels of the pro-inflammatory cytokines. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about this pro-inflammatory cytokine, uh, interleukin-6. Um, interleukin-6 does just what I said. It uh, mobilizes your body's healing response. It also crosses the blood-brain barrier to, um, in, to have you have a fever if you have an infection. Um, and people have been interested in these cytokines. One of the reasons people have been interested in these cytokines from the standpoint of neurocognition is because cytokines can lead to bad things happening in the brain. So extra ones, these extra levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines tend to lead to a process called oxidative stress, where you have too much of these uh, reactive oxidative species, you may have heard of them, ROSs, um, in your brain neurons, and that is neurotoxic. It's not good for your neurons to have that. And so the link between inflammation and neurocognition has been suggested, and I'm going to show you some evidence about that. In terms of the link with emotional functioning, um, here part of it is, I mean, think about how you feel when you have a fever and you have a lot of these inflammatory cytokines floating around. You don't really feel like doing much, right? <laughs> you just want to lie on the couch. Um, so the apathy that comes with the sickness or illness behavior is actually kind of a lot like some of the apathy that you get in depression. And so that made people think about whether there might be a role for some of these inflammatory markers in, in depression. Also, in mental illness, there is a much higher rate of um, morbidity and mortality, and not just because of the mental illness. That is not just because of suicide or other types of behavior. There's people with bipolar disorder, for example, die more of cancer and other all-cause mortalities than people without bipolar disorder. So mental illness link to inflammatory markers also is one of the reasons, and, and to morbidity, is one of the reasons that inflammatory markers have been looked at vis-a-vis -vis emotional functioning. 
And as I said, because there's this sort of pro-inflammatory -inflama state, which sometimes, as you get older, which people sometimes call inflammaging, is why people have looked, <laughs> have looked at it in cognitive and emotional function in old age. OK. So here's a very recent study, 2014, not by me. Um, and what they did is they uh, measured people's cognitive performance over three or four occasions um, where people were coming in around their mid 60s to sort of 65 to 80 people started the study and then they followed them over time on two or three different occasions and they also measured their blood levels of interleukin 6 on two occasions and then they grouped them into three different groups one where on both times they measured IL-6 it was pretty low low levels of this pro-inflammatory cytokine. And on other, other people, it was high on both occasions. So those are the high, high people. And then anybody else that had a mix of the two where it was changing. This graph is called a survival plot. So it's a little bit different from what we've been looking at before. But basically, on the y-axis, what you see is the proportion of people without cognitive impairment. So they recruited people that didn't have cognitive impairment to start with in the study. And so up here, everybody started with no cognitive impairment. And then as they went along, more and more people got out of that group of no cognitive impairment and sort of uh, ended up in a group of being cognitive impaired. So this is the proportion of people without cognitive impairment, and it goes down with age, which is similar to what we've seen in some of our other things. But the important thing is what happens in terms of whether you had consistently low pro-inflammatory markers or consistently high pro-inflammatory markers. And the main difference was when this consistently low pro-inflammatory markers, you were sort of protected from cognitive decline. So let's look here, for example, at age 95. You can see that about 58% of people do not have cognitive impairment compared with in the two other groups, it's more like 45% that don't have cognitive impairment. So uh, this was a nice demonstration that in a longitudinal fashion that your level of this pro-inflammatory cytokine was linked to your cognitive decline. Um, what about emotional aging and these uh, inflammatory cytokines. So you remember that I showed you that graph of people who reported how likely they would be to help a stranger. This was our compassion scale. So as I said, we were very interested in understanding that full range from people who were very compassionate to people that said, eh, not so much. So we brought in people from, based on their survey responses for an in-laboratory experiment. And we did a whole bunch of things with them. We did brain imaging. We did cognitive testing. Um, we did some uh, testings of their, of their physical function. Um, but we also did a blood draw. And we looked for levels of inflammatory cytokines. And I'm showing you the data here for IL-6. And another thing that we did is when they were in the, at the laboratory, we did a, a more behavioral test of their level of empathy, which is very related to, co to compassion. That is, in order to want to help somebody, you have to know that they're in need, right? So you have to be able to read and understand their emotions. So we gave them a test where they looked at pictures, and they had to say, how much do you feel for this person? And the people who uh, reported high levels of, or the people that showed high levels of affective empathy, that is, they felt with these people that were in um, troubling situations were more likely to have low levels of the pro-inflammatory cytokine IL-6. So the people, these people down here who um, were not very clued in or interested in the emotions of other people had a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokine. And work that's been done by others, but not me, um, looked at how IL-6 is related to other kind of positive psychological traits and found that, again, the lower your IL-6, the less of this pro-inflammatory state you had, the more optimistic you were, that is, the more you expected good things to happen in the future, and also the more positive you were, the more just positive emotions, happiness, basically, that you had. So it looks like that lower IL-6 is good, Higher IL-6 is not so good, both for emotion and for cognition. Um, but once again, there's some caveats. <laughs> um, so
So first of all, I've just showed you the data for IL-6. There are data for other pro-inflammatory cytokines, but it gets a little bit more mixed. Sometimes some of the anti-inflammatory cytokines are acting kind of like pro-inflammatory cytokines in terms of their relationships, um, and they're not working alone. You know, they all are activated at the same time, and there's probably complex interrelationships. So again, I wouldn't necessarily say you should go out and have your doctor draw your blood level of IL-6. Um, also, it's, you know, what the sort of normative level of IL-6 is hard to know. It really depends on whether you've been sick lately, et cetera. Um, and the other caveat is, again, if you thought, okay, well, if the problem is that I have a pro-inflammatory state, maybe I should take an anti-inflammatory. <laughs> um, and there was some suggestion in the literature that people who took a lot of anti-inflammatories just naturally uh, for arthritis or for whatever may have had a lower risk of Alzheimer's disease. But there's been some equivocation about whether that's really true. And this one very large study where they actually gave people who had a family history of Alzheimer's disease anti-inflammatory treatment did not show that it had any effect on cognitive decline. So it's not, sounds like it's not going to be as simple as just a general NSAID, you know, taking a bunch of Advil is not going to, is not going to do it. Um, but I think the more we learn about the particular cytokines that are involved and exactly what they regulate and how they're interrelated to other ones, maybe that would lead to development of something that's more targeted and could have a positive benefit. Okay. So I've talked a little bit about some of the caveats. These are where I see are the remaining issues in blood-based biomarkers of cognitive and emotional aging. First of all, a lot of the studies that I showed you were, again, cross-sectional. Not all of them, but a lot of them were cross-sectional um, in terms of the outcomes. So just looking at a particular period of time in an older adult's life and what is their cognitive function like, and not looking necessarily at changes in cognitive function or changes in emotional function. So that we need more longitudinal studies, and we also need more that do that measure the blood-based markers at multiple time points. Now, for the genotypes, that's not going to matter. Your genotype's not going to change. <laughs> you can just measure that once. But, and, and, but for the telomere length, it might be interesting to see if there's something about the rate of telomere decline. So looking at it, you know, once and then a year later and then a year later. How quickly are you losing telomeres? That could be an important factor. And similarly with the inflammatory markers, as I mentioned, it kind of depends on where, whether you've been sick lately. It might depend on the time of day that the blood was drawn. And so the idea of measuring it in multiple time points and trying to see kind of what's the cause and effect. It's a little difficult at this point to know whether the the emotional dysregulation is causing the pro-inflammatory state or, other, or vice versa, and same with the cognitive changes. Um, the other thing that's a little, that needs more study is what is the relationship of these blood levels to what's going on in the brain? So some people say, you know, it doesn't really matter what your inflammatory cytokines are in your arm, what matters is how much of them go across the blood-brain barrier and make a difference there. And some of them do cross, and there may be mechanisms by which they can have an effect on the brain, even if they're peripheral, but we need to know more about that, and we don't know as much about that in humans. Um, and finally, the interplay between all of these factors. So how, if you're somebody who has an ApoE4 genotype and high IL-6, and your telomeres are really short, does that mean you're doomed then <laughs> for, you know, or are there some ways in which they compensate for one another? So looking among the biomarkers and within them to see what the interactions might be between these different factors. And again, there's many other factors that could be looked at, like gene expression um, and levels of other types of markers, uh, like vascular markers, et cetera. And the interplay, I think people are just starting to do that. But now that we have techniques to be able to look at a lot of things at once, a lot of genes at once, a lot of biomarkers at once, we actually could, you know, from a single tube of blood or maybe two or three tubes of blood, um, <laughs> measure all those things on the same people. And some of the studies that we're doing at the Stein Institute um, and in my own lab um, on bipolar disorder, we're gonna try and measure a lot of these things at once and see how they relate to one another. So finally, the most sort of provocative thing is the implications of all this for enhancing quality of life. And I think the first thing is getting back to the idea that there is no such thing as an average older adult. 
that clearly any strategy that we have to enhance cognition or to improve quality of life in an older age is not going to work if it's a one-size-fits-all. There's no such thing as saying, OK, all older adults should respond to this. Because everybody is aging differently. We start from different points, and we change at different rates, and we change in different domains. So some people might have a lot of physical declines, but no cognitive declines. A lot of they might, people might be very emotionally stable, but have problems in terms of their cognition. So for all those reasons, we really need to take a more individualized approach to designing enhancements um, for late life. Will there ever be a pill that will combat cognitive and emotional aging? I don't know. Um, certainly, people are interested in, in making that. And as we know, in the US, everybody would love to just have one thing that you could pop. Um, Right now, there's, there's nothing out there. And I think, again, for all the caveats that I said, it's going to be very complicated. And so it might be very difficult to have one pill, one magic pill, that would do all things. Um, but there may be some pharmaceutical approaches that will be developed that will help in conjunction with other activities. Um, but for right now, the things that we know can help are things like exercise, diet, um, there are approaches to enhancing cognitive functioning by practicing, uh, doing different kinds of cognitive training exercises, um, and things like meditation and mindfulness that help with your emotional regula re regulation and resilience. And all of those things are, are, have some evidence that they work. But what I think might be interesting in terms of the blood test is could we use the blood tests to target those people who need those interventions the most? Because they do take time, and they, do, they, are, they are difficult, and not everybody wants to radically change their diet. Not everybody wants to go on an exercise regimen. So maybe we could use the blood test as kind of a first pass to say, you know, based on this combination of genotype, pro-inflammatory cytokines, we see you as somebody who's at risk for cognitive decline. Maybe you would, this would be a good time for you to start an exercise regimen. Um, and so I think that a personalized approach to uh, enhancing things will help us. And hopefully what we'll do is eventually, we won't all become above average, but maybe we can move the average. So maybe we can enhance everybody so that they have better cognitive function, better emotional function, and have much more quality in the extra life years that they have. So um, this is the, these are the people that help me in my laboratory. And these are the folks at the Stein Institute for Research on Aging that I really want to thank um, for all of their help. And then I want to thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thanks. Yeah, so the question was that, um, that uh, the audience member had heard of people taking experimental drugs to try and uh, lessen the effects of Alzheimer's disease or to slow the cognitive decline, and, and what might they be targeting. Some of the ones that are out there, I don't know what your, this experimental, particular experimental drug is doing, because I don't know which one it is. But the ones that have been out there, so for example, Aricept, which is Dinepazil, um, what they're trying to do is increase the availability of neurotransmitters at the synapse, so that if the synapses are dying off or not functioning as well, or it's not as many of them there, the ones that are still there will have more of the neurotransmitter and perhaps be better able to transmit the signal. So that's, that's the general idea. And they just may be trying different types of neurotransmitters. That one has to do with acetylcholine. But there are other ones involved in cognitive processes that perhaps this experimental drug is targeting a different um, approach. <laughs> Good question. Um, so the question was, since there's a range of, throughout the lifespan, are um, People who are grouchy old people probably were grouchy young people. Um, it's very possible that they were. And the same thing with cognitive performance. Clearly, there are individual differences that may have had to do with your genetic makeup or your nutritional uh, exposure when you were young that may sort of set your cognitive level at a certain level. And you may not be able to kind of go above that. Um, but like I say, the problem is, especially for some of these emotional um, measures and grouchiness, whatever that, that might be, people haven't done a lot of longitudinal studies. So we don't really know so much about whether people are getting better or worse each individual. The um, Successful Aging Evaluation Survey is a longitudinal study. And we're actually now in our third 
wave of that, third year of um, that evaluation. So we'll be able to look a little bit closer at those individual trajectories for some of these traits. But I suspect that there are some people who are just like that all their lives. Um, and whether they will be more or less amenable to enhancement, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe they'll, they, and you can teach an old dog new tricks even if it's been there for all, all your life. Right, so the question was about early um, developmental disabilities, learning disabilities, autism, um, and whether there is a combination of these traits that you see and then continues through life. Is that, is that your question? Um, well, certainly, uh, most, unfortunately, most of those disorders don't go away as you get older. They may lessen in their severity, but they're going to still be there and there. So those folks are kind of starting at a different t uh, point. But there's an interesting literature, which I'm not super familiar with, but I know that now that we've had a lot more experience with people uh, aging with, say, autism, because the rates have gone up and then there's more people who've had it since they were ch child, children, to see whether those folks have an accelerated aging pattern. That is, maybe because they already had sort of an early brain insult from the disorder itself, will they be more likely, do they have maybe more of these pro-inflammatory cytokines at an earlier age um, than other people? And so I think that's an open question, but a really interesting one. That's a great question. So the question was whether for folks with mental illness and even for folks without mental illness, if um, some of the therapies, for example, cognitive rehabilitation or um, cognitive behavioral therapy that targets uh, their responses to stress, whether those have been shown to influence these markers. Um, and I think those studies are just start being started, but there are some um, Anecdotal, there are some small studies that may speak to that. So for example, there was one study of um, college students who were taught to do a mindfulness meditation approach. And they then stressed them out a little bit, making them speak in front of an audience <laughs> like this, um, and, and measured how much of a spike they got in their IL-6. And they found that the people who had done the intervention but not just done the intervention, they had to have also practiced it at home. If they did the intervention and they practiced it at home, they did not have as big of a spike in their IL-6. So there's definitely that, that direction does work. You can alter some of these biological factors. You're not going to be able to alter the genotype, but you might be able to alter gene expression or the levels of the proteins and, and, and such from non-pharmacological approaches. That's a good question. So the question is um, whether having it, someone who would start off with sort of fairly normal or middle of the road in terms of their inflammatory markers or telomeres, whether then getting a chronic disorder or a, any kind of disorder could then kind of reset you to a more negative place. Um, and I, <coughs> I wish that there were more studies about that. Certainly, these things come into play during the disease. And, and most diseases that people have looked at, like diabetes, they, people have elevated IL-6 and other pro-inflammatory markers while they're, you know, it, but whether that sort of changes permanently their set point, there haven't, I don't think, been enough longitudinal studies to really show, again, the cause and effect is, is very tricky. So a study that I'm just now starting, um, in the next month or so, we're going to, again, looking at bipolar disorder, but from the standpoint of these inflammatory cytokines and how and whether there is a cause and effect with their cognitive change over time. So we're going to do a longitudinal study where we bring people in and we measure their inflammatory cytokine levels actually three times in a two-week period to get kind of a nice baseline. And then we'll follow them over the years for the next four or five years to find out whether those people who had the most dysregulation early on are the ones that end up with the lower cognition or if it's the other way around. So when they came in, if they were low in cognition, that's what was really important, not the, the levels. And then, and then a year later, their cytokine levels went, the pro-inflammatory levels went up. So hopefully we're going to be able to see a little bit of the cause and effect within both the bipolar people and the people without bipolar disorder. And in the bipolars, we're also going to look at the effects of mood and stress. So we're going to be measuring their mood levels with using a cell phone. They're going to be measured three times a day, asked about their mood, and then we'll be able to see the relationship also between that is, are the mood symptoms causing the pro-inflammatory activation, or is that the that inflammation happens and that leads to a mood episode? 
If it is known, I don't know it, <laughs> but that, that is a great question. Um, I know that the estrogen story is wrapped up in this, so estrogen ha plays a role in inflammation, um, and so part of the rationale for the big um, estrogen studies that were done to try and prevent Alzheimer's disease, which unfortunately were not successful, actually had to do with inflammation as well. So um, there probably is a gender difference that has to do with the interaction with sex hormones, and um, I just don't know that literature very well, sorry. Well, partly it was just curiosity because we saw this range, and, and honestly, I thought when we asked these questions that everybody was gonna say, oh yeah, I'm gonna be nice to people, are you kidding? I'm a great person, I would always like to help strangers. So I was kind of surprised that not everybody said that, and so that surprise led me to want to investigate it more. But the more I thought about it, the more I was interested in the idea of empathy and compassion as or enhancing that as a way to improve quality of life in older adults. So um, as I mentioned before, older adults are, are more likely to have physical ailments and challenges. So there's a lot of stress in older adult from uh, in old age from that. Um, loss of social support, loss of spouses, loss of family members and friends, um, and then a t tend to be more isolated for both of those reasons. And those things are all not good for your health. So you, you do a lot better if you have more people around you to support you, and obviously grief and bereavement can have negative consequences. So my thought was that if we could understand a little bit about why people differ in their levels of empathy and compassion and figure out some ways to enhance that, that that could do two things. One, it feels good to be nice to other people. It actually activates the same brain regions, uh, altruism activates the same brain regions as you know, just when people do something nice for you. So doing something nice for somebody feels good, and so anything that can make you feel better is probably a good thing. But the second thing is that it may enhance your social support network. It may strengthen it or broaden it because the nicer you are to people, the more people want to be with you, right? Um, you know, because you're seen as somebody that helps. So um, that was the further rationale for looking into this is to try to understand where, was there anything that we could learn from the research to help us enhance um, empathy or compassion. And so we're now moving in that direction and we hope to get some research funds to do a, an empathy enhancing intervention. And our initial idea is that we will um, be offering drama lessons to older adults so that they can um, learn how to put themselves in the shoes of someone else and embody their emotions and their physical being and see whether that enhances empathy. All right, well, thank you very much for your attention and all your great questions. <laughs>